We'll start with one of our ballads and then we'll move on. <laughs> we'll go from there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm not even really needed. I feel like you could do this without me. Oh, you're just radiant not. and talented am, and such a delightful presence. Deep sweat <laughs> with radiance, but I am here for it. Yes, radiant. Well, <laughs> I'm not sure how many of you have read this incredibly gorgeous book. I was lucky enough to read an early copy like it may have been a pdf at that point yeah that sounds right <laughs> yeah and um it was breathtaking it was exciting it was so honest and intimate i felt like i knew you and your friend larissa just from reading words on a computer screen and so obviously if you're here you have some love for our author and and for the book um, and hopefully you'll take it home and if you don't already have a copy and share it with friends and loved ones, because this book is so full of love. Um, it's really an honor for me to be here with you as an author, mm. as a black woman, as a mixed woman, as a tall woman with curly hair. Tall woman with curly hair. <laughs> That's it. So, so tall. Just, yes. I didn't know that. From let you shine and shine on you. I'm just really honored to be here. So... This book um, deals with some very heavy things mm -hmm. because it's about the love between best friends and death and mm -hmm. sudden death and loss and how in the world we process and come to terms with the loss of someone that we love very deeply, especially when we didn't have any context or, or way to anticipate the loss. Um, I'm curious, as a person who has lost and also as a writer, how you made the very brave decision to process this experience and what would become a public book, mm -hmm. right? Did you set out to do it? Did you set out to write a book that honored this part of your life and your friend? Did it kind of stumble into being? Tell us a little bit about about that part of the process um, it kind of stumbled into being it started as like a eulogy that i wrote i knew i wanted to read something at larissa's funeral and so i wrote something and then i couldn't stop writing things and um i kept doing that and my best friend and writing partner steph tatarin who is sat over there with red hair um <laughs> she i she was like my sounding board and i would send her essays and pieces i was working on and eventually she was like, you have a book, like, you, do you know that? And mm. so it wasn't until then, it, until then it was just processing and um, getting, it just felt like catharsis. And it wasn't until an outsider was like, I see this in its complete form. Uh, what about that? What if we did that? <laughs> yeah. I mean, my hat goes off to you because catharsis is incredibly messy. Mm. <laughs> I mean, often, right? I guess sometimes it's not. I can't recall something cathartic that wasn't messy in my own <laughs> life off the top of my head. But your book is not messy. Your book is <laughs> graceful and rhythmic mm. and spirited and crystal clear about the emotion. There's a deep sense of place, you know? So the fact that you started with catharsis and ended with a really tight, rhythmic, artistic piece of writing, mm. and it's your debut? <laughs> like, Thanks. where's the wand? How, I mean, did I you mean, go through I, many, many drafts? Like, how did that... Yeah, I did, and it wasn't always, like... It didn't always... It wasn't always the in the order that it is now. Mm. But also, like, at the time when I was writing it, it did not feel crystal clear. It felt like I was in something that I couldn't extract myself from unless I wrote a sentence about it and then I was like okay I can see that feeling and that's that's a real thing instead of this like horrible feeling that right. I had um so uh I can't guarantee that I'm not gonna cry tonight I don't know and if you cry too I'd love that so just <laughs> <laughs> you know you can be my emotional support audience um yeah so I I don't I don't know. It's interesting to hear it described in this way. And when mm. I read reviews, I'm like, huh, yeah, huh, you did that. Okay. <laughs> that's cool. But um, no, it did have a lot of drafts. And I, um, I'm not very good at looking at a screen and like absorbing what is there. Mm -hmm. And so I did do this quite mad thing <laughs> during COVID where I printed my entire book out and like put it around the walls of my office like a that like is a, a bit crazy mad. 
Norwegian detective. I was just like, I gotta, I gotta figure it out. Um, and it was helpful, I think. And, and my husband really liked it. He was like, oh, that's what real writers do. And I was like, I don't, I don't know if that's true. But um, yeah. So well, I'll tell you best. one thing real writers do. What? Cry. So they cry, <laughs> they cry, they cry at all phases of publishing. <laughs> um, let me put it this way. Just because you write about your feelings doesn't mean that your writing has feeling. Mm. Right? But if oh. you're a real writer, you can write about your feelings in a way that like tugs the heart of other people. Mm. And that is so powerful. So oh. thank you for that. Thank you. That's so nice. <laughs> also powerful to me, like from from the jump, is the mm. title of this book, right? The mm. Dead or Gods. It feels like something out of Shakespeare or the Old Testament. Like it has this gravitas and this um, ring of truth that is very powerful. And I love the phrase also because it points to something mysterious, right? Mm -hmm. Like our relationship with God or gods or our higher power or lack of relationship, whatever it is, is um, rich and mysterious. And there's a lot of kind of guesswork involved, mm -hmm. no matter what we believe. And that's also true with our closest bonds. Even the people that we love the most, there's some mystery and guesswork involved. Mm -hmm. So it, just do me a personal favor and unpack the title a little bit because I can't get enough of it. And I okay. think people are probably curious. Like, I okay, am. so <laughs> basically, um, <laughs> I, I just stumbled across this phrase like in writing and I really liked it. And I, first of all, did what I did with both of my children's names, which was I Googled it to make sure that there wasn't like an existing. So you, you stumbled know. upon it. Like, no, no, no. I, I was, I was like writing. It's your book. phrase. It's my phrase. Yes. But I Googled it to make sure that it was no one else's property, Got um, it. intellectual property. And, uh, yeah, I, re I liked it because someone asked me recently, why not the dead are angels or something like that. But I like the pluralization of gods because it's, reminds me of ancient greece and the, or N nordic gods who were deeply uh flawed people um despite being lauded as deities and i felt like hmm. that kind of was how i felt about larissa in my grief was that i, I loved her and, and my writing was becoming more and more like worship but also i was having to confront some really difficult things about who she was and the things that I didn't know about her despite believing that I knew her the best out of everyone. Um, and so I wanted to make sure that everyone knows <laughs> that uh, they are fallible beings. I also think that when you're like at a funeral, people are always talking about, um, I don't know, uh, what a great person they were and mm -hmm. blah, blah, blah. And I think what gets lost in that is the nuance of someone. And it's really easy to focus on um, the nice neighbor that they were and it's harder to look at and also they were a bad tipper or something <laughs> you know right. um so I, that felt important to hold those things in duality with each other I want to talk a little bit about Larissa okay and you okay um this book part of its magic is that it zeroes in on the love and fellowship between black women, which has always existed, right? Mm -hmm. Forever and ever, but doesn't always get the spotlight. Mm. And it was nourishing to me and exciting to see you take this particular kind of bond mm. between black women that is singular, you know, and lift it up and just hold it steady for hundreds of pages, you know, mm -hmm. not in a way that um, was dishonest and like too hunky dory at all, but in a way that really acknowledged the complexities of the bond and mm -hmm. the strength and the beauty. And um, that's as much about Larissa as it is about you because it, it comes from both of you, right? Mm -hmm. that, that this bond existed that you were able to write about. So if you would tell us a little, a little bit about Larissa or, or about the bond you had with her. Um, okay. So that if you want, we've got <laughs> yeah, tissues no, 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 up no. here. I'm, I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm okay. ready. Okay. Um, uh, Larissa was just very, very cool. I think 
there are very few people in this room who met her personally and everyone can testify to the fact that she was like the person that you walk in and you're like who is that Mm. like she's so cool um and I think having and I was an awkward teen as many of us were Uh, Larissa seemed to uh sidestep that part of teenageness um but having someone shine a light on you when you are the most uncomfortable and unsure of yourself when they are so when they're such a fabulous person um is just so nourishing and it's what i needed Mm. but i also thought think we had like a lot of push and pull in our relationship um yeah she could be quite she was incredibly smart but like book smart and not good at like navigation um like if you were like you go out to the pizza shop you make a left you go outside and be like i am immediately (laughs) lost (laughs) immediately um but yeah she was uh just a very important person and you will see and i think so many of my stories in this book uh about the times that we grew up together are fabulous and wonderful and cool because she was there and I hope that comes across I hope that you all love Larissa when you're done reading it too because she was special I think it would be impossible not to not to feel the love for her and to feel Mm. your love and a love love for her as a reader um early in the book you describe her as a unifier Mm. and in the chapter you're talking about race and being a mixed person who's black and white and Mm. neither black nor white, Mm. you know, everything and nowhere all at once. Um, And I've never heard anyone described quite that way. Like I've heard a politician described as a unifier, Mm. you know, (laughs) but um, I've never heard a person describe a friend or a loved one that way. Mm. Will you tell us a little bit about that aspect of who she was for you in terms of helping you yeah. in your mixedness in particular? I think, yes. Um, and my mixedness happened on the backdrop of like some very white worlds that both Larissa and I were a part of, like the fashion world. Um, we were both fashion models in London in the early 2000s. And then, um, unfortunately, I'm still, I'm still doing it. Um, <laughs> but, and also we were big into like rock and roll music and metal and, that is also a very white world and so I watched her be a dark-skinned black woman in these spaces and hold both her blackness and her love of these participation in these pretty white spaces together and I feel like she opened a door for me as to what what I was allowed to be Mm. um so maybe a unifier in that sense um yeah and I also I grew up with a white mother and I didn't really have a black presence in my household and her Larissa's family are Ghanaian and very Ghanaian and so um being best friends with her and being best friends with any Ghanaian means that you will be (laughs) taken right in yeah you know (laughs) there's a of recognition (laughs) over here I love Um, it (laughs) so in that respect I was able to kind of live in a in a white house predominantly white household yeah. not predominantly I have a black brother but um and also be a part of this black household and kind of have these two worlds exist alongside each other I'm really into things that exist alongside each other like as that. am I yeah yeah I mm-hmm. think as a mixed person racially anyway I mean there's lots of ways to have duality in, mm-hmm. in your life but black and white they're kind of heavy dualities (laughs) it's helpful to have um Mm. people or things in your life that bring them together Mm. or allow them to run on parallel tracks so that that really interested me I want to ask you about form because I'm a selfish writer and I'm always (laughs) looking for tips and tricks okay so this book is no no no, you do know (laughs) you do know the answer to this because you wrote the book um, it intersperses your prose, mm-hmm. right, which is by definition, because it's gone through iterations, polished. You know, it's still raw and it's still full of emotion and feeling, but it's been revised. Let's yes, put it that way. Yes, so your prose thankfully. is interspersed with emails and maybe text messages, but I think mostly some, emails. Some, yeah, some AIM 
messages. A little, I believe. little bit of yeah, yeah. there between <laughs> you and Larissa that yeah. are, they sort of explode off the page because I mean, you know how we text, right? It's like exclamation points, emojis. Yeah. And that feeling is in, um, the dialogues between you two. Mm. So I love the contrast, right? It makes a really interesting rhythmic reading, but it also does more than just that. I think I'm curious, like where that idea came from mm. and why you went in that direction. Cause you didn't have to, you know, you could have left those out. Must, totally. <laughs> must be important. I'm curious about uh, that choice. Uh, Steph, do you just want to stand up? <laughs> um, Steph, uh, I had been writing like snippets of what become what is the book now, yeah, um, and sending them to her, and bless her heart, she just like absorbed everything and was such a wonderful um, landing point for so many of my ideas. And with, I was going through my emails and I was looking at old emails between me and Larissa mm. and I was sending them to her like pages, pages like Steph, look at this one, look at this one. And she was like, what if you pulled one and you had them in your book also? Um, and so I felt like that was a really lovely idea because it humanizes Larissa and gives her dimension because it's one thing to hear me talk about it uh, mm -hmm. and it's another thing to see um, her <laughs> weird way of using uh, punctuation or the nicknames that she called me and um, her like chronic misspelling, which my editor told me to leave in. <laughs> so yeah. if you see typos, that's that's not me. Um, it's vivacious <laughs> and endearing yeah. to see that aspect of someone's voice, that totally. texture. And I think one thing that I love dearly about what I'm left after Larissa's death is our WhatsApp conversations mm. because she sent me a lot of voice notes. I have her laugh. I have her stupid jokes I have her telling me about some guy she dated and um I wanted to have that in the book somehow but I didn't I couldn't have audio so that was my my way I wonder if you have you recorded the audiobook yet are you going to no I am lightly bullying my publisher to let me do it oh bully I, I mean yeah. don't even lightly just no like just <laughs> full-on assault my publisher. yeah okay. <laughs> okay I feel like if it's a memoir something is surely. lost by having someone else surely what it. if they're not British that's terrible exactly <laughs> yeah you have a beautiful voice and it's your words you. I mean <laughs> <laughs> the thought there was you know you could have a little like Mariah Carey sings between the chapters in her audiobook lush she does that. so plug for the audio but i mean that's not about mariah carey it's, it's about you but no, like, it's fine we can mariah can be in the room too that's a fellow fine. mixed really heard woman that's like, true that's true just, come on, mariah. so you're saying i should sing in between i'm okay. saying there's room for creativity yeah. no, I like in the that. audio that's format cool. and like wouldn't that potentially be magical that'd be really cool let's all text or email my publisher right yes now. there'll yeah. be a sign-up sheet before you yeah. leave. um okay I want to ask you about grief again. I'm sorry, but that, it's my jam. I'm a grief ambassador. There, it is my there you welcome. have it. <laughs> so there's a section in the book where you are talking about Larissa's birthday. I think it's her first birthday after she's passed away. And um, you're, I wouldn't say you're berating yourself, but you're maybe lamenting that mm. you haven't prepared a celebration for her that perhaps you wish you had the energy to or something. There's a sense of kind of, I wish I had done this, but I mm -hmm. didn't do it. And you mentioned the incomparable Joan Didion and sort of, well, she wrote two incredible books in her grief. And um, I love that part of the book because it points to the pressure in our culture to do everything right, including grief. Mm -hmm. And you know, the bitter irony is we don't have models for how to do grief in, a, in many ways in mm -hmm. our culture. And yet that pressure to kind of perform it or do it in the correct way or the best way can still fall upon us. Um, so it, as someone who has grieved, I appreciated that acknowledgement, mm -hmm. you know, with a light hand, you acknowledge that in the book. But then I immediately thought as a writer, well, did she feel that pressure to do grief right in this book right it's like mm. there's on the one hand there's a desire to paint an authentic portrait of anyone warts and all foibles and all 
on the other hand, we don't speak ill of the dead, mm-hmm. you know, and yeah. you're doing this balancing act um, through grief and in a way that is going to be public. So I'm curious if the pressure ever got to you or if you just didn't feel it, you know, that would be amazing if it didn't get to you too. I think mostly because it was so personal to me and for a long time I didn't know it was a book. Mm -hmm. I managed to kind of sidestep that Mm. and because they were private things between me and Steph. Um, So (laughs) yeah, I didn't, I don't know. It didn't feel like something that would be overly examined when it came to the editing. Sure. Yeah. Um, But I don't know. I think when I was writing the book, the initial couple drafts did not include the way in which Larissa died. Mm. Um, And because I felt like it was dishonoring her or um, uh, like speaking ill of the dead, you know? And then I kind of had to examine that. And, And for a long time I was writing and I couldn't get any further and this was when I knew it was going to be a book, but I couldn't, I couldn't move it forward and I wasn't sure why. And one of my friends was like, is it because you're not talking about the way that in which she died, which is intrinsic to how I processed it. It mm-hmm. has context within my own life. And, um, and in that way I was like, oh shit, no, I do. I do have to talk about this. Um, so I suppose in that way, I feel like I kind of examined my grief and, and it and it brought me deeper into into my processing of her death, I feel, and made me look at it, honestly. You talk about it very beautifully. It's one of my favorite chapters um, in the book. And I don't, you know, I don't want to say too much because um, I want to honor the way you've paced it and the way that you reveal it and, you. and the way you write <laughs> it. But um, there is a chapter that addresses how she died head on and it is gorgeous and painful and honest and I think very necessary. So my hat goes off to you for the oh, bravery thank of you. <laughs> being willing to go there. Um, yeah, just as a writer, as a mom, as a friend, every part of me just is in awe of your willingness to, to go there and then to render art out of the mess of grief is very, very powerful. Thank you. <sighs> um, on a slightly different note, yeah. this book is not all heavy. There's plenty of heaviness in it, but mm-hmm. there's also some effervescence and humor and um, style. I had, you know, thinking about you with the standard in L.A., like, you know, there's there's some moments that are really just fun to mm-hmm. travel through with you. And the sense of place in this book mm-hmm. is so strong. London, LA, the different places that you take the writer to. I don't know exactly how you do it. And I read like for craft, I read it first just to enjoy it. And then I was like, wow, I feel like I just spent a month in London. How did she do that? Where did she put the descriptions? What kind of adjectives? You know, I was trying to unpack it like selfishly for my own selfish use. And, um, Writing about place, it's like a, it's like pulling a, a, what is it? The rabbit out of the hat. Mm -hmm. Like you can describe a place. This is, we're in a city. It's a room. There's (laughs) books. But that doesn't necessarily give you the feel of the place. Mm -hmm. And you do that so wonderfully. And I think that you have something that you're going to read from London. I have a short thing. Yes. Um, Yeah. Here we go. Chapter 14. And this is a preview for the audio book. Um, (laughs) So as as Savala mentioned, there will be a sign up. Um, East Finchley. It's raining here. A spring shower. The kind that starts and finishes in less than 20 minutes. I like this kind of rain. It reminds me of being somewhere tropical like Jamaica or Hawaii. The frantic outburst of rain like a shout or a cry in the middle of a blue sky. There is something cathartic about it to me, something freeing. How I'd like to feel sometimes, that out- that outburst, that unsanctioned scream. And then suddenly, over, and the sky is blue again as if it never happened. The only clue is the green of the plants that are now al- alive with wetness. It makes me think of the flat in East Finchley, with that surprising garden, a backyard of British greens. It was way too good for us. We got it through sheer luck and pandering, it was on a nice quiet residential street at the weird end of a north of the northern of the northbound northern line. 
one tube and hardly any buses. The house was a duplex. Below lived a middle-aged couple and their autistic son. Upstairs was a two-ish bedroom flat, spacious. Bamboo furniture in the front room made it feel like you'd fled the city to Spain or somewhere. There were floor-to-ceiling sliding doors that looked out onto a terrace and beyond that, a series of lush green gardens. It was a transformative space. The first time we saw it, after weeks of looking at pokey flats with zero natural light, zero outdoor space, we were immediately in love. True to our style, it was out of our monthly budget by a good couple hundred pounds. And true to our style, once we set our hearts on it, we couldn't backpedal. A nice Jewish man who was leaving London for Tel Aviv agreed to rent it for us. to us. We fluffed off our finances, made them look more impressive than the reality of being a scarcely employed model and a subordinate, subordinate in a small publishing house actually would. I took the bigger room, the one with the jacuzzi tub and the private bathroom. We asked my friend Charlie if she wanted the small room, tiny really, for a discounted rent, and she accepted. Everyone who visited said it was like being on holiday, coming to our flat. The terracotta floors in the front room, the greenness filtering through the glass. It didn't feel like London at all. That's probably why we liked it. We had so many parties there, tolerated by our downstairs neighbours, who said they were just happy that, to have people who wouldn't complain about the loud and unexpected sounds their son would make in frustration, or happiness or sadness. It didn't bother us. We didn't sleep normal hours, and so the outburst in the night wasn't as disruptive as it might have been to people who worked more conventional hours five days a week. We never really saw the teen, save for sunny days when he bounced on a trampoline in our yard. Giddy, giddy happy sounds then, a boy of maybe 17. We rarely thought about how lucky we were back then, but the house was a find. Of course, the bamboo furniture was wildly uncomfortable, just glorified patio furniture, and the light that filtered that streamed through those joy, <laughs> streamed. This is will not be in the audio, but <laughs> um, <laughs> streamed in during those long summer days was unflinching. We had no blinds. The plumbing in the house was old. Toilets and showers backed up. The terracotta ta- terracotta floors were cold in the morning. Slippers or bed socks were the only way to survive the winter. And we never had such a big place. We underestimated how much it would cost to heat it, to keep it running. We were the youngest people on our street by miles, for sure, and stood out. It was one of those times that, as an established and settled adult, I look back with a fondness, a rosy haze. I forget the poverty, the crippling monthly financial stress of rent and bills, the desire to have fun adventures that were always, almost always cost prohibitive. And now that Larissa is dead, it feels even more magical. It feels like a time when we were in a bubble together, formative months for our friendship. That was the time I felt closest to you. That was the time I was the most me and you were the most you. It is, oh no, <laughs> maybe I'll cry. It is, just, it is nostalgic, the way the smell of the rain is nostalgic. It was cold and miserable and thoroughly British at the time, but now all I remember is the wet earth, the cleansing and quenching, the buds opening on trees, becoming possibilities. Mm. <laughs> I thought I was picking a safe reading. I was like, <laughs> this one, I can't cry at this one. I can cry at this one, so. Beautifully read, beautifully written. I mean, I'm just going to put my professor hat on. Raise your hand if she took you to a place with that writing. <laughs> oh, thanks. Who doesn't have their hand up? Right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I said, who doesn't have their hand oh, up? Yeah. I'm watching. No, nobody. Everyone had notes. their hand up. <laughs> so that's what I'm talking about. Like, you write about emotion. You write about place. You take your readers with you into intense moments and fun moments. And then when you let them go, they're different because they've had this profound experience. So that is the kind of book I want to write. <laughs> I want to read. Thank you. You did it. We're so incredibly thankful before we go to Q&A, I just have to ask, it's a little soon, yeah. but like, what's next? <laughs> like, oh. What's the next book? Is there one, is there a daydream of one that there we is, can just pine for? There's 40,000 words of one so Woo. far. Are there um, really? Yeah, 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 really. Dang! But she's been on the back burner for a minute because <laughs> children and other things. And, um, but it is... That's a book though, 40,000. It is almost. Yeah. She's almost there. Um, she's for, she's 40,000 words of fiction. Um, and I wow. repeat fiction because it is a <laughs> satirical thriller about a woman, a uh, postpartum woman who decides to kill her husband. Oh um, boy. 
<laughs> yeah, I just wanted to write something fun. I'd been writing about <laughs> death a lot, and I was like, what if death was fun? Um, and I looked at my husband, and I was like, I've got it. <laughs> not really, not really. He's lovely. Um, yeah, so that's that's what's coming next. But who knows when sh- when I'll pick up a yes. Laptop fair enough. Again. Take your time. <laughs> yeah. Enjoy the bliss of this moment that is so well earned and. You've given an incredible gift to readers in Thank this room you. and everywhere. I just want this book to soar. And like people, Oprah, Good Morning America. Shonda I mean, Rhimes. I mean, Shonda like, let's Rhimes, not argue with the right? greats, okay? <laughs> the poet Maggie Smith. I mean, yeah. you know, cream rises to the top. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Should we give it up one more time? Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to let you do that because I don't know what I'm doing. There we go. Um, All right. I'm going to attempt to bring this around the little tangle. So we'll see if it will let me do it. But if anybody has any questions, please raise your hand and I will bring the mic to you. Anybody? Yes. Hi, Irene. Um, Since we're doing the vicarious writer thing, it seems, I was hoping that you would reenact when oprah does she call or oh. what like can you break alas <laughs> alas oprah did not call she doesn't call <laughs> oprah's people sent an email to my people who emailed <laughs> their person and oh. told me <laughs> and i did do quite a loud scream um and then i went to my local wine store and bought like a champagne that i couldn't really afford <laughs> and um c- opened it today so yeah, that's what I did. Yeah. Well, congratulations. That's such a feat. <laughs> Anyone else have any? Yes. Oh. Hi. Hi. What's up? <laughs> um, I was wondering, has her family had a chance to read this book? Um, yeah, they have. Uh, her mom read it in a very early iteration. Yeah. And what did they think? Um. That is actually a really difficult question. Um, No, no, you're fine. Um, I think there was some questions about including the way Larissa died. Um, I don't think that they wanted that. I did a lot of um, work to remove any identifying feature. I didn't, I took out her full name. I took out um, some more identifying aspects of the book to kind of keep it just Larissa instead of the full person <laughs> that she was but um and I edited photos so that we're not using her photo to promote the book but um yeah that was actually a really difficult conversation um I don't want to <laughs> talk to this woman's grief too much but her family is in just like a different place with their grief than I am um and I felt like the inclusion of the way Larissa died was contextualized within my own life and my own experience with my family. Um, and so that's why I felt that it could be talked about uh, with integrity and not like a flashy selling point, um, which is why also I'm I'm skirting around that, <laughs> the cause of death now. So, um, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, babe. <laughs> <laughs> We have more questions. We had one over there, maybe. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Hit me. me bring this to you. Yeah. Hey. So, um, I just wondered, like, you wrote this book here in the in the U.S., but I mean, you were dealing with grief from far away, and and I wonder how much of your current life as an expat here affected your writing about that time there. Hmm. yeah that's a great question um yeah excellent question joe um i i imagine quite a lot i really tried i think as i describe in that passage it's really easy to think about uh youth as this like glowy glossy time and i think that the distance of me living in america and my experiences with her being there does have the tendency to be like remember how perfect it was but um 
I really try to like hold myself accountable to the reality of of being a young person in an expensive city like London or loving someone like Larissa. Um, so I hope, I hope it didn't affect it negatively, but I think it probably gave me more perspective and distance. I know that when I'm back in London, um, there are certain places that like, for want of a better word, trigger me. And I'm like, oh my God, I'm, <laughs> I'm right back in it. And I wonder if it would be, if I would have been able to write the book in that space, you know? So yeah. Yeah. For your yeah. Your I am going to London. Oh, yeah, yeah, please. Oh. I'll have all of Larissa's friends are coming. So, yeah, it's going to be a good time. I think we have time for one or two more questions. Come on, think anybody... of a question, guys. <laughs> <laughs> we need at least five to make it a good round. <laughs> oh, yeah. Might have to come to me. <laughs> That's all right. Hi. Hey. <laughs> um, okay, my question is, how do you want readers to feel when they turn the last page and close your book? Oh, shit. You can You're beautiful, <laughs> by the way. You can tell she's a writer. You're gorgeous. Um, <laughs> um, I hope um, changed. I hope hopeful. I hope that they're not... I hope that they realize that you don't have to be crushed by grief. I hope that they realize that um, love can uh, continue to grow and become more com complex even when one of you is dead. Um, yeah, I hope they, I hope they close it and they're like, oh, Larissa seems cool. That's, that'd be nice. <laughs> yeah. Any more questions? Yes. Do you mind coming up to me? Yeah. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Hi. Hey, <laughs> babe. So I have a question about how do you feel now sitting here when we were hiking and doing all that, talking about this book, and was it going to become a book? Like, now how do you feel sitting here today? Um that mm, I have spent the past like month or two where the publisher amps up press and discussing like where the book is going to be talked about and where pieces that I write and for various magazines in order to get press for the book and all of this stuff I've spent it kind of out of my body like looking on myself and I haven't been able to uh have that <laughs> connection with the experience at all um and actually today oh this is maybe the moment i cry today is like the first time that i'm like oh this thing happened it to happens me. Yeah. <laughs> <Yeah>. uh. <laughs> well Yay. unless we've got more <laughs> that seems like a pretty lovely note to end on <laughs> Um, I want to ask us to give it up one more time for our incredible author. Yay. Yes. <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> oh, no. I don't have waterproof <laughs> mascara on. This is terrible. <laughs> <laughs>